Welcome back to Control System Lectures. Hopefully if you're watching this, you've already seen part one of the Fourier transform. This video just continues where that one left off. However, before I jump right into part two of the transform, I have a correction that I need to make concerning something I said in part one. One of my subscribers asked a question about where the scaling term goes when you move from a periodic time function to an aperiodic time function. And then how does that output relate back to the amplitude of the sine wave? Well, in an effort to simplify the Fourier transform into basic operations, I accidentally left off that critical part of the formula and the explanation. I stated that the frequency information was amplitudes directly, and I didn't state that I had to scale the frequency data first to get the amplitude. And so this is my attempt to correct my mistake and also answer his question about scaling in the process. Now, the main goal of part one was to simplify the inverse Fourier transform into just a series of multiplication and summation steps, which is analogous to how you would do it manually if you only had two or three sinusoids to calculate. It's a simple concept that I think gets overly complicated by our mathematical nomenclature. I wrote the inverse Fourier transform like this, where e to the i 2 pi nu t is the complex representation of sines and cosines. The function f of nu is the amplitude and phase information for all sinusoids across the spectrum. And the integral then sums up all of the results for all time. Now my error in part one though was that I forgot to mention that the function f of nu is also scaled, so it doesn't directly represent the amplitude and phase information. And so in this video I'm going to try to explain why there's so much confusion about this scaling term and how it gets handled in the Fourier transform. We'll start with the time signal that's periodic over the period t. In this case, I'm using a ramp function. If you wanted to represent this time function in the frequency domain, then the complex Fourier series is the transform of choice. The Fourier series is used for periodic time functions and converts a continuous time signal into a discrete frequency signal. The transform pairs look like this. A pair is both the forward and inverse functions together. They're called pairs because the two equations undo each other. If you plug the answer from one into the other, you'll get back your original function. However, here's where it gets tricky and frankly pretty annoying. If you look up the equations for complex Fourier series, you might not see it written exactly like this. That is because there are multiple variations of these equations. This includes using frequency instead of angular velocity with the relationship omega equals two pi f. Now in the way that I wrote it, k is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. Also, the equations might integrate over different periods. Or you can replace the period t with the fundamental frequency f naught, where f naught equals one divided by the period. And lastly, moving all or part of the scaling factor, one over t, to the other equation. And it's this last variation that really confuses the issue of Fourier series and Fourier transforms. And that's because I could have written the equations like this, where the scaling factor one over t is in the inverse equation. And you'll see this in some references. And by doing this, you're still keeping the equations pairs of each other, but you're redefining what the output signal consists of. In this case, the output signal is unscaled, but here they're scaled by the period. So what's right? Well, they both are. But however you scale them, you need to make sure that you undo the scaling on the way out. In other words, make sure you're using a set of equations that belong to each other, or you're using a transform pair. But just remember that there's a scaling term in there somewhere in one or the other pair. So let's move on. We started with a periodic time function, and we used the Fourier series to represent the signal in the frequency domain. But what happens if we increase the period of the periodic function? Then the fundamental frequency gets smaller and smaller, and each harmonic of that fundamental frequency also gets smaller in proportion. Then if you take the limit as t approaches infinity, the result will be an aperiodic function. This is a function that has a period of infinite time. And when you take the limit as t approaches infinity in the Fourier series, you arrive at the Fourier transform pairs. But now the question becomes, does the Fourier transform still have scaling? And if so, where did it go? 
Well, let's see if we can answer that by walking through a Fourier transform example. But first, I want to start with a simple way that I use to remember the Fourier transform equation. And that's the equation in green at the very top of the screen. Let's start with an analogy. If you want to know how many $5 bills it would take to make $15, how would you go about figuring that out? You'd probably take 15, divide it by 5, to get three $5 bills. Or I could have worded it how many 5s are there in 15. But can we extend this analogy of division to help us understand the Fourier transform? For example, how much 15 hertz signal is there in a particular time domain signal? Well, extending the analogy, we would just divide the time signal by that sinusoid, and you'd be left with the answer in the frequency domain. So let's see if that's true. In the complex Fourier transform, we represent sines and cosines using Euler's formula. So if you took the time signal, x of t, and divided it by some version of e to the it, then we could reasonably expect to get something out that represented how much of e to the it is in that signal. But leaving a complex number in the denominator is bad form. So we can move it to the numerator by making it a negative exponent. And now, this should start to look familiar. It's already similar to the Fourier transform. Now all we have to do is integrate across all time and for all frequencies across the spectrum, and we'll get the frequency domain representation of the function. This might look like mathematical magic. At least it did to me for a really long time. I mean, how does simply dividing by e to the it get us any kind of useful frequency domain information? If you work through the problem graphically, it tends to make more sense. Let's take a cosine wave, cosine of t, in the time domain. If we multiply this signal by some form of e to the it at a frequency other than what the cosine wave is at, for example, cosine of 2t, and then we sum the result across all time, I claim that the sum will approach zero. Now you might be asking why I'm multiplying. Didn't I say divide? Well, we moved the exponential into the numerator. And when we did that, the divide became multiply. And e to the minus i t is the cosine of t minus i sine of t. So I'll multiply cosine of t by this yellow equation. So here I'll try to draw out the result of cosine of t times cosine of 2t, but you can multiply these examples out on your own to check it out. What you'll find is there's a beat frequency between the two, a repeating pattern, that will always be exactly the same amount of positive signal as there is negative signal. And the sum, as the limit approaches infinity, approaches zero. Another way of saying this is that the green signal cosine of t has no power at the frequency of the red signal cosine of 2t. So let's move to the next example. What if you take cosine of t again, but this time you multiply it by e to the negative i t at the exact same frequency? So you'll have cosine of t minus imaginary sine of t. Here I accidentally drew a positive imaginary sine wave instead of a negative one, but the results will come out the same. You can try this on your own. Now for the real component of the frequency data, you're going to get cosine squared, which will have a value that's only positive. And for the imaginary component, you'll get cosine times sine, or negative sine, which again will sum to zero across all of time. So you'd expect to have no imaginary component and a really large number for the real component. In fact, you'd expect an infinitely large number, since the area under the green curve for all time would approach infinity. And if you plotted this point in the real imaginary plane, you'd be able to find out what the phase and the amplitude were. And since the transform output is real, the angle off the real line is zero degrees, which corresponds to a zero degrees phase shift, which is a cosine wave. And what's the amplitude? Well, here it says that it's infinity. But what does infinity really mean in this case? Well, that's where the scaling comes in. The output of the Fourier transform is scaled, by the period, which is the integration time of the time signal, which in this case is infinite. So in order to get amplitude information out, you need to divide by an infinite number. But once you hit infinity, all information is lost, right? I mean, what is infinity divided by infinity? But this is one of the useful properties of the Dirac delta function. We can still have infinity without loss of information. 
Recall that the Dirac delta function is an impulse that is infinitely tall and infinitesimally thin, such that when you multiply the two to get the area under the curve, you get one. Therefore, by multiplying the amplitude by the Dirac delta function, and then taking the integral of the product for all time, leaves the area under the curve, which is the amplitude. So in this equation, the Dirac delta function is zero for all frequencies other than when nu equals the fundamental frequency, and then it goes to infinity. So now if you solve for, or you look up the Fourier transform for cosine of t, you'll see that the result is the amplitude and phase information scaled by the Dirac delta function. Let me plot this so you can understand it a little bit easier. Here the horizontal axis is frequency, nu, and the vertical axis is the real component of this yellow equation. You'll see that half of the amplitude occurs when the multiplying frequency is at the positive fundamental frequency, nu naught, and the other half is at the negative fundamental frequency, just like we'd expect. And this is how scaling is accounted for in the Fourier transform. But the Fourier transform can also handle a phase shift in the time domain. If you solve for the Fourier transform of a sine wave, you'll see that the real component then sums to zero, and the imaginary component is the one that goes to infinity, which means that the frequency information is all imaginary and no real parts, or 90 degrees phase shift. And if the signal had only been phase shifted by 45 degrees, you should expect to see an equal portion of real and imaginary components. And so this is how I tend to think of what the Fourier transform is doing. In the forward direction, it's just taking a time domain signal, then it's dividing it by a bunch of sines and cosines, and then adding up how much stuff is left across all time. And in the inverse direction, it's taking the scaled amplitudes and phases, and then multiplying them by a bunch of sines and cosines to get back to the time domain. And that's really all they're doing. All variations of these equations are performing these exact same simple steps. All right, so I hope these two videos help to demystify the Fourier transform a bit for you. Like I said before, the equations can get a bit confusing, but I think most of that confusion stems from the fact that there's different references using different variations of the equations. However, no matter the variation, the underlying concept of what the transform is doing is the exact same. And if all you remember from these videos is that, then you're still going to be in pretty good shape. As always, please leave questions and comments below, and like I did in this video, I'll try my best to answer them. Also, for the first time ever, I'm on Twitter, so if you want, you can follow me at Brian B. Douglas. As always, thanks for watching, and I look forward to hearing from you.